The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. IntelliFlow is on a mission to give more people access to financial advice. Their technology, IntelliFlow Office, powers and streamlines the advisory experience for over 30,000 financial advisors worldwide, making an impact at every stage of the advice process, including practice management, revenue management, cash flow modelling, client portals and more. IntelliFlow Office helps advisors manage all their client and provider data within a single integrated ecosystem that just works. Discover IntelliFlow for yourself by visiting IntelliFlow.com. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I'm James Wrigley. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Ali Fordham today from Verse. Uh, Ali, thank you for joining me. Thanks for having me, James. I've seen your name pop up uh, a lot over the years, different places, LinkedIn and awards and, and, and other bits and pieces. It's, it's great to actually finally finally speak to you. Corey connected us and uh, thank you, Corey, for that. So great to have you here. Look, we're going to bounce around a bit. We were just talking before we pressed record to say, look, what, you know, what's the, the main topic going to be? But we're going to bounce around a bit. We'll talk about video SOAs. Ali's in Brisbane. We'll, we'll talk about kind of remote work, females in advice, um, AFA, all of these kind of things. So lots of different topics that we'll, that we'll get into. Uh, but maybe, Ali, if we – maybe we just start off with the, with the location thing. So you're relatively recently joined Verse. Now, you haven't been at – a year and a bit by the looks of yeah, things. Yeah, I'm trying to, trying to think. I think it wasn't it, yesterday, but it wasn't also no, wasn't five years ago either. It doesn't feel like it was yesterday. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and sometimes it feels like a lot longer than it is. I think it's about 14 or 15 months now. Yeah. yeah I think probably 15 months since I joined Earth. Yeah. And, and your work that you're doing at the moment, is that like primarily remote with clients? Is that face-to-face? Is it a bit of both? Like what What's that look like? I think it's probably around 90% remote, yep. which is a huge change for me because in the past, I was probably seeing most of my clients, probably about 80% of my clients face-to-face. Yep. So it's a huge turnaround yep. um, from what I've traditionally been used to um, and probably something I didn't think would be possible because um, in Brisbane, we really probably haven't been impacted by COVID as much as other cities. So I know going through that experience, most of the clients wanted to come back with the office pretty quickly after our first lockdown and, and meet up in person. Um, so the concept of me working remotely, seeing clients across the country and connecting with them and building that relationship, you know, via Zoom um, was pretty new for me. Yeah. Um, but I think it's been quite successful so far. Yeah. And so you, you moved to Verse. Was that was that that would have been after COVID? I've lost track of time when yeah. all of that happened. I think it was that like three years ago now. It doesn't. Some people think it's still going on. I'm not, I'm not really sure, for, but um, I've got clients who still are very much in a bit of the COVID bubble. Yeah. But um, yeah, it was after COVID. So, and I think, you know, because Burst is a, a Melbourne based company primarily, a lot of our teams in Melbourne, um, a lot of those clients are pretty used to connecting remotely. And a lot of the team are used to working remotely as well, because of all the experiences they had. So I think that set us up to be able to make this work really well. Yeah. And, and prior to Verse, what, what were you doing prior to working with Verse? So I was working at another practice, um, an independent practice in Brisbane, um, which was, a, I guess, a startup that sort of formed and got some legs. Um, and I was there for really about five and a half years um, before working at Verse. Yeah. But how does it, how does that go, like you talk about kind of Verse kind of headquarters in Melbourne, most of the teams down here, I've been down to the, to the hub kind of co-working space before um how, like how, do, how does that work starting a new job interviewing meeting the team learning the processes all of these kind of things when you're at the other end of the country compared to where everyone else is how does that work it was actually so much smoother than i thought yeah. and i think that's because um we have really well structured processes in place which is definitely something that attracted me to working at first um dan who's our head of ops is amazing so he really did a lot of the onboarding 
you, I've actually got a good story in a way that um, I was finishing up my old role and I was actually going to Melbourne anyway. I'd already had that planned long before chatting to Corey and, and starting at birth um, to see a friend of mine there. So I met up with the team for dinner before I started and came back to Brisbane to start the job um, on the first day of Monday. I tested positive for COVID on the Friday. <laughs> so my first week was probably a bit of a mess because I was coughing and, you know, wasn't probably 100% that whole week. Um, classic, I picked up COVID from Melbourne. That's what I like to think anyway. <laughs> That's what everyone um, says. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but you don't get COVID when there's heat, do you? No, that's yeah. a myth. But <laughs> so that was a really interesting experience. But yeah, I think because we do have really well structured processes um, in place, that that really helped in terms of the onboarding. And I think they've only gotten better since I've started because we've onboarded a lot of teammates since I started at first. We're growing pretty quickly. Yeah. I think the other thing though is that um, you know at that stage the team was working two days a week from from the office and the rest of the time from home. So um, they were sort of used to working remotely as well. And we have a, a big team um, in the Philippines as well. Okay. So we, we're pretty used to trying to connect things remotely. I would say that we all feel very much like we're part of a team. Um, and so, you know, doing meetings on Zoom, whether people are working remotely or in the office, is just part of every day. Yeah, gotcha. So yeah, I felt like it was, it was quite straightforward. Yep. And what what's a typical client look like? for you at first and, and and is it different to what you were doing in your previous role in the previous business you're working in? Not particularly different. Yep. So I'm really passionate about giving advice to wealth accumulators. So I've really enjoyed working with clients who might be the mum and dad with family, might be 35 to 55, you know, they're doing real well in their career, they're time poor. They really need that sort of person to hold them to account to to achieve the things they want to achieve over time. Um and make sure they've got the right discipline in doing that. But also, they, you know, a lot of those clients want to live life at the same time. Uh, so, striking that balance. So, that's sort of the similar clients to what I was working with in the past. Okay. I think I've probably got a few more pre retirees now as well, which is exciting. It's a space that I probably started out my career working in. Um, and that's always good to sink your teeth into some of those strategies. Yep. But that's probably the typical sort of client I'm seeing at the moment, 35 to 55 year old sort of professional, I would say. Yeah. And, and how are you how are you engaging with clients like that? Like I always like to listen to others uh, ensemble podcast episodes with other people where I'm not the not the host as such. Um and it's, some people get really deep into like cash flow, other people don't. I've tried it, it hasn't I've never made it click properly. Like are, are there elements of the client's life that you're working through and, and, and how are you dealing with the different elements? I think, um, again, to speak to our process that we go through at Verse, what, again, another thing that attracted me is the onboarding process and the client experience is incredible. And the foundation of that really is spending 90 minutes with a client, understanding what their values and their intentions are. Mm. And I think maybe Corey's spoken about this in the past on the Engine Room podcast, but that really set the foundation for the relationship to understand what is really important to them. You know, the values are a real reference point in terms of how they make decisions in life and it's often a reflection of some of the experiences they've been through as well. Um, you often get some money stories that come out of that and you know, childhood experiences, etc. Uh, and then the intentions, obviously, um, or some people call them goals, that's just as important to understand where they want to be heading in the future. I think that really sets the framework for the relationship that you want to build with the client over time that all of the advice is always coming back to making sure they're achieving those things. Yep. Yeah, I do really enjoy getting into the cash flow side of things and I think a lot of people have spent time trying to work out what's going to be the right way to make it work and actually operationalize it in a business because that's hard. Yeah. And you don't want to get into the weeds with cash flow either because you can end up spending the time you've got aside that's going to be really really valuable for a client. You don't want to be telling them how much they should spend on coffee every day. <laughs> I think probably that might be a low value add to their overall life. But it is still, I believe, a really important part of um, how they're going to pursue their intentions and, and get them to where they want to be. And that's why we do spend time talking about cash flow. But we're not talking about cash in that first session when we're talking about their intentions, that's for sure. Yeah, so, so that, that values and intentions, uh, meeting, whatever you want to call it, it, kind of interaction you have with the with the clients, is that is that like some structured... You know, you, you've got a gender or something. There, there's some structured 
way of, of, of dealing with that? And, and how early on in the engagement process with the client are you doing that? Like, is that the, aside from a first, you know, 10 minutes high, I'm Ali kind of brief get to know you. Is that the first major interaction you're having with them? Like, where was it in the process? Yeah, so fr- from my perspective, when I'm meeting them, that's probably the first major interaction I'm having. But before any client gets to that point, um, they do go through an introductory chat with either one of our advisors or our associate advisors. And during that session, um, we're finding out what's really important to them, why they're reaching out for advice. But we're also telling them what our process is, how we work here at Burst, and um, just making sure they've got really good expectations of what the next couple of sessions together are going to look like. So they're really well informed of the fact that they are going to be opening up to their advisor and talking about what's important to them in that session. And some people do it better than others, but I think um, you know the right sort of client, I think for us, is one that really embraces that session together. Yep. Because that's the type of advice that we love providing, that goals-based advice. And um, yeah, when they really open up and, and connect with you during that session, it's, it's really rewarding. It's probably one of my favorite parts of the job. Yeah. Um, you get all sorts of emotions that come out of there, which... I think you do with like a lot of different types of meetings that you have, but it is really well structured um, to, to optimize, I guess, what you need the client to, to open up about. But also, I think it, it really does help to build that rapport. And especially if you are working remotely, having that structure in place uh, has been a real added benefit to build the rapport with client. Mm. So, so that's an interesting process of how like a, a client gets to, you know, sitting in front of you for this not ninety minute meeting. It's not necessarily you doing that first introductory half an hour or, or whatever it might be. So, is it like how, how is how is that first interaction allocated amongst the team? And then, how does someone end up sitting in front of you versus sitting in front of a different advisor? How, mm. How's that all worked out? Yeah, it's a great question. I think as we've gotten bigger, it's something that's sort of evolved a little bit. Um, so, we all um, where we have time will go through those introductory chats with clients. Yep. Um, I probably do less and less of it these days because my diary tends to be full with, with seeing clients. In the past, those introductory chats are sort of allocated based on the availability of an advisor or an associate advisor. Yep. Um, at times where you know we think it's going to be better suited for a, a client to be in front of a particular associate or a particular advisor, we will adjust who they're meeting with. Um, and we're trialing a couple of things as well at the moment to make sure they're in front of the right person. So we'll see how successful that is yep. um, but then once they get to that introductory chat the person that they're speaking with um, is sort of identifying what's important to them and who's going to be best placed to help them moving forward so you know if it's a client who's um you know working with Centrelink they might be better placed with, with chatting to, to Lucy or if it's a, a client who's had a, a TPD play Michael's really excellent in that area um, they're a pre-retiree, you know, SJ might be the right advisor for them. So that's sort of how we get a bit of a sense of who's going to be the right client. Um, often we've got, you know, capacity issues as well. So, you know, there might be a bit more space for one advisor rather than another. So we, we put them in front of who's available straight away to make sure we're keeping the ball rolling. Um, but yeah, generally we're trying to fit the client, I think, with who's going to be the best advisor for them. Mm, that's interesting. So it, it's something that we're trying to grapple with at the moment. So we get and there's a, a range of inquiries that come through the business at, at the moment and what we've been doing, but it can cause some roadblocks in different parts of the process is that like, if I'm the person that's done that introductory um, conversation with the client, I'm typically then they're trying to book them in to meet with me. And if it's one of the other advisors, they're doing the same thing. And so you end up with some people that might be really busy in periods of time and then others that are a little bit quieter rather than having it kind of centrally managed to a degree where you're kind of yeah. allocating it out a little bit based on time, but then also matching up the client with the right advisor at the same time rather than just lucky dip as it kind of can feel at the, sometimes. Yeah, and I, I completely understand that's something that I think I've um, well worked with in the past and dealt with, whereas I think we've sort of got a funnel that's going all into the same sort of location and it's coming out of the funnel um, and getting the criteria right in terms of how it comes out of the funnel I think is really important. Like I know I've done introductory chats with clients in the past and known that they're going to be much better suited to work with a different advisor mm. and once you get into the rhythm of it, it feels really natural to probably place them in the hands of the right person but I think instinctively as advisors we're never used to doing that. We always want to, you know, you build that relationship on an introductory chat, you want to keep the ball sort of rolling and keep 
keep working with them over time. So yeah. it's hard to move away from it for sure. Interesting. Thank you. That's I'm um, giving a, getting a bit from this too. Hopefully, uh, hopefully others <laughs> listening in are as well. So we've we've kind of tackled the it's you know somewhat remote work. If most of the teams down in Melbourne. Um, so there's uh, people in Sydney. Do you have? Do you have team members, you, you mentioned the Philippines, but, but are they team members in other parts of Australia? Maybe not advisors or, or associates or like what's what, what's a split look like? Yeah, so my, my teammate Anna, um, she lives down on the Mornington Peninsula. So she probably comes maybe a little bit more into the office than I do, but not too much more. And Anna's actually on, on parental leave at the moment. She has a beautiful little girl, Olivia. So apart from Anna and myself and PH team, the rest of the team is based in Melbourne at the moment, but I think that's you know not to say that if the right person came on board, they don't necessarily have to live in Melbourne. And I'm proof of that. Yeah, clearly it doesn't um, matter where they live, does it? Yeah, and you know, in terms of yeah, it was probably a really big roadblock for me to join Verse, thinking about working remotely. Um, and I spent plenty of time talking to my friend Cara Williams, who's at Sufficient Funds, about this, and she was really helpful because she works 100% remotely and the whole team at Sufficient Funds do. Mm. And um, that really helped me to get through that roadblock. And I think just from a cultural perspective as well, because so many of us are doing remote work, and again, because the team's probably in the past spent two days a week working in the office, there's a lot of things that we do um, as a team whether it's like our gratitude sessions or our team meetings and different things like that, that are all sort of over Zoom that help us to build that culture as well, which is, again, really unique. Um, so, yeah, I think it still helps us to sort of feel all connected regardless of what part of the country mm. we're in. I think it, it's a it's a common thing. I was speaking to an advisor at Fox and Hare that, you know, they ditched their office a little while ago and it's the same thing. There's a, there's a where you do operating primarily remotely in your in your case there's a there's a concerted effort to have these check-ins and so forth rather than just leave it to like I'm in the office now and we we tend to not as much as people are half at home half in the office it's it's walking past someone in the hallway where those catch-ups are happening whereas you need to make more of an effort where everyone's remote um if we can uh pivot a little bit into into video uh SOA so I we were saying um before we press the record Corey was really generous with spending a fair bit of time with me to just explain from his perspective what you what you're all doing uh, in the space of video SOA. I know he was at a he was at a conference or something. I saw on on LinkedIn. He's, he's been talking about it all over the place. But but it'd be good to hear from from you as an advisor uh, where at the very last stage of getting it up and running here, but I, I yet to actually present one of these video SOAs. Can you talk me through the from your side the you know the transition from a traditional paper based PDF maybe you know sixty odd page SOA to to what you're now operating how you're delivering advice now can can you talk us through what that's like Yeah, I, I think uh, everyone started doing it a little bit differently with video SOAs, and I think about my experience and learning how to present I guess advice documents. Your SOA over time, although we all hate the fact that it's 60 pages or more, is kind of like a little bit like a security blanket in a way because it's got all of the you know, benefits and risks and all the things that you need to go through in there. So um, when Corey told us that he had spent a whole weekend thinking about video SOAs and using his kid's bedroom and whiteboard to <laughs> map out how this process is going to happen, I thought he's crazy. Um, but it is, it's been so beneficial Uh for, for our clients and just in terms of making our life easier. And probably my only initial apprehension was that that sort of security blanket is taken away. But aside from that, it has been amazing. And the response from clients is is fantastic, um, especially clients who've received other forms of advice documents in the past as well. And you can almost sort of talk about it, I think, as like a, a value add for the client. Um, you know, do you remember getting a 60 page advice document in the past? Yes. Well, ours is 25 pages and six of them are pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I think also for us, the, the video SOAs kind of work well in terms of our overall client engagement process. You know, a lot of the stuff we're doing is remote. We use a lot of visual tools through our client process. And then the video SOA really lends itself an extension of that process. Yeah. So, how we do it is we have a, a summary of advice. It's about 25 pages in length and there's still some compliant pages in there. Unfortunately, you can't get away from them as much as you read through the ASIC guides. You still need them in there. So 
for the cover page, um, you know, who's providing the advice, all those sorts of things. The word statement of advice and those kind of things, yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But in terms of the actual content, um, you know, the, the really good stuff is probably about two or three pages long in terms of the summary. And then you've got a couple of pages which are your product replacement tables um, in there. And we um, developed that summary of advice. I think it saved the team a lot of time in putting that document together. Um, no doubt there's still plenty of work to do in terms of getting all the compliance side right. Then once that's prepared and we review it, um, every advisor will prepare a slide deck that goes alongside that summary of advice and we'll bring up any other sort of visual aids. You know, it might be a, a website for a super fund or it might be some some data from a particular fund manager that you want to bring up um, alongside that. Or I often just drop them into my slide deck as well. And we use a slide deck to really present the advice and talk about the concepts that we're working through. Um, and that's probably got the, the better reaction, I think, from clients in that if they read through the advice document, it's actually easy to read. They understand it. And then when you're giving them the context with the slide deck and the other resources, um, they really get it. Yep. And um, the other thing that we do is because the advice document is much smaller, we actually set it out to the client a couple of days before the meeting. Okay. Because they can actually read it, most of the time they've they've read through it and they, they get most of the advice already. And they're already engaged and kind of ready to go. Um, so it's almost like a formality of the advice to speak. So the last part of that is that we do some modeling and you know, there's all different tools out there in terms of what you can use for the modeling. But I think that really wraps up the whole advice process well because we're providing goals-based advice. Yeah, okay. And if you can visualize that through the modeling and spend more time with the client showing them what their trajectory looks like and whether they can do the things that they want to do or there's trade-off decisions, um, the modeling is a great tool to do that. You can actually spend more time then delivering value to the client of what's important to them and less time on the compliance side of things. So are you doing that modeling? It sounds like there's this kind of three elements to it. There's this 25 page document sorts that so you your paraplaning team's putting that together. So you've got this 25 odd page document. You're then putting together a, a slide deck which does that does that reference back to that document? So when you're presenting to the client, are you presenting are you presenting this 25 page document or you you've sent that to them beforehand and you're really just presenting the slide deck? And then, a, and then the last part is the modeling. Like, are you doing that live with the client, or how, how's that all? How's it all come together? Yeah. So, in terms of the summary of advice and the slide deck, I'm probably chopping and changing between the two of them. Yep. Um, because the clients have read over the advice document before the meeting, obviously, you still need to go through the whole thing with them, but it makes it easier to go through it with them. Um, so, sort of chopping and changing between between the two of them. Um, in terms of the modeling, it's all prepared and, and ready to go before the meeting. And um, then I'm showing them live in the meeting what that modeling looks like. Yeah. At times, I won't necessarily do it. It depends on the client because what we do is we actually record a video illustrating that the modeling and, and showing them what it looks like for the client, going through all the assumptions. And that goes into um, the SharePoint folder that the clients receive. So they can come back and look at it whenever they like. You know, I'm not sure how many clients actually do look at it so far but um you know i met with a client yesterday afternoon and we were just talking about our retirement trajectory and i said you know every time there's anytime there's ever self-doubt i want you to come back and look at that modeling video and just remind yourself that you are on the right trajectory things are going well you can do the things you want to do so yeah that's sort of the last piece that wraps it together so in that sharepoint folder they have the summary of advice they have the project meeting slides they have the modeling recording um and any other tools that are important um to go in there as well good job so the, this is where where you know on the cusp of doing it, our our power planning team is putting the, the finishing touches on this kind of summary of advice document that you refer to. So we started off with the with the whole FPA PowerPoint presentation, and then we're going, oh, what are we going backwards and forwards, and we're going with this, this summary thing. The bit that scares me is the modelling because I don't know how to do it. Like I, I didn't spend any time in I didn't spend any time in power planning. Uh, all the modelling is done by our our power planning team. Fortunately, my associate advisor has done a whole lot of time in power planning and can knows all of that stuff inside out. So, you know, if we were to do the modeling, I could have him come along to the meeting and he'd be the one to be able to bring it up and adjust it if necessary. But I've no idea myself. Well, that's probably my one downfall as well, James. Like I've spent a lot of time power planning yeah. over the course of my career and I've always known how to do kind of every job across the business. And this is the first time I can actually say I have no idea how to do 
for that. Um, so I am slowly learning the modeling a bit more over time. I think the rest of my teammates are much better uh, at doing it. Yeah. But um, I guess as long as you can present to it, that's the main role. And um, yeah, when you've got a great team around, you can prepare it beforehand. It definitely makes it life so a lot I'm, easier. I'm comfortable presenting the, the nice graphs and things that come that spit out of it, but but ask me to say, oh, you got that number wrong, or what if I do this and what if I do that to try and do a live freaks me out. I need to spend a bit of time sorting it out. So so you you because yeah, your client your client into, um and are uh, receptives of this. They're, they're enjoying it. They're really liking it. You mentioned at the start, uh, referring back to the old documents. But it, so even existing clients that have had it the old way, preferring it the new way. Yeah, 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 definitely. And even clients that I've sort of onboarded who received advice elsewhere in the past, often they're apprehensive about getting a long-winded sort of document. Um, so yeah, I think they've been really receptive of it. And I think especially um, the, the visualization, you know, the, the tools that we use the slide deck to help understand the concepts is it's also really important. It just, just as you just a summary of advice is. Yeah, I th- and I think it ties in with the, the way that you know, you're clearly interacting with the clients. Like most of your meetings you're doing online, if you're using all these visual tools and so forth, in the whole process leading up to it, and then you turn around and say, oh, here's my 65-page document that we're going to scroll through and I'm going to pick apart a few things. I suspect the summary of advice is probably just those key things that you would have been scrolling backwards and forwards to when you're presenting the advice anyway. Um, yeah. If you're putting that document in front of them. It is. So we've got a bunch of the team that still do meetings in the office when clients request it. And it still works really well um, in person as well, you know, sharing it on a screen and jumping between different documents and modeling. Um, it still works really well. We do record all those sessions together as well. So I actually met with a client in person yesterday to present a, a video SOA and um, we still record the session. Um, for compliance purposes, but it still worked really quite well. And I think just coming back to your comment there around, you know, they're the things that you're probably picking out anyway from your advice document and going through. When I was a power planner, I remember, you know, printing out the advice document many years ago and putting it into a binder. And, you know, they were really long winded documents. And I remember a bunch of the advisors I was working with at the time were actually like sticky noting the, the pages that yeah, they yeah. wanted to, to present. And, um, you know, to think how far we've come that we're, we're getting away from that. Maybe we'll have a new version of an advice document in the next sort of 12 months or so. We'll, we'll see how that all unfolds. Yeah, you know, it's definitely, I think, improving the experience for clients, I hope, in the context of the legislation. Is that just, for, um, I guess, clarity for anyone that, that's listening, that the, the in-person meetings where you're presenting advice in person, although kind of calling it a video SOA, you're still recording that through Zoom or, or whatever it is. So you're firing up Zoom, screen sharing through Zoom, but onto the TV that might be on the wall in the meeting room or something. That you use. Is that that's how it's working? Yeah, yep, that's right. Perfect. So, you know, um, moving the camera around to say, hey, this is James. James is here in yeah. person getting his advice today. Yeah. Um, just for compliance purposes, that clients always think that's a bit funny. But um, aside from that, still getting the same experience and sharing onto the TV. Yep. And then maybe last topic to to tackle your kind of involvement with the fpa obviously merged with the sorry with the, with the afa obviously merged with the fpa recently can, can you talk us through what your involvement's been there is, is there anything ongoing that you're doing there now with the with the merged group like what's what's that all been like for you so i started doing some work with the afa a few years ago um, i got nominated for an award and went through that whole process got to meet a bunch of great people out of the afa and, um, yeah, sort of as part of that, they were talking about doing different events and I thought I could help with some of their events. So started helping them out. That led me to being part of the Inspire Group, which is um, a big part of the AFA. It's one of the subcommittees. Um, it's about really promoting women in a bus. Mm. And um, for the last couple of years, I can't remember how long, I've been the co-chair and now the, the chair of the Queensland chapter of Inspire. So moving forward... Um, we've obviously merged together, which is great. It means I don't have to pay two membership associations anymore. <laughs> oh, you were both. You are a member of both, were you? I was, yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I think more than anything, it's a great thing for the industry to have one voice representing us. Um, and I am the Queensland chapter chair moving forward for Inspire. And um, I think in southeast Queensland, over the last few years, we've probably been doing a lot of events 
um, as a combined entity anyway, uh, which is great. And we've really come together as a sort of FPA, AFA group pretty well, I think, over the last six months. Um, and we've got a bunch of events planned already. So as part of the broader FAAA group, we've got an end of financial year event um, coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, and I've been pretty heavily involved in helping to organize that, which is going to be great to sort of, I think, celebrate the success of people that have you know, really contributed to both those organizations over the past period of time. I know for AFA, it's a 70-year history. It's pretty significant. That's a long time, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's huge. Like we got an email that came out on Friday just to say, you know, this is officially the end of that chapter. And as someone who's only really been part of the AFA for a very short period of time relative to 70 years, I think it was you know, a bit emotional. And I think for some of the people that I work with, in that organisation on a regular basis, they've been really long-term members, so I think it was a sad day for them, but it's also signifying uh, moving forward into the future, I think, a united voice, which is great. Um, So the the event's going to sort of celebrate some of that history, um, but sort of forge our legacy in terms of what we're going to do moving forward. So we've got a few sort of other events planned for the rest of the year, but from an Inspire perspective, our role is really about connecting women together and promoting women and, and uplifting them and not just advisors or, you know, um, support staff in the industry. It's about our industry partners as well because mm. they have a big role to help in terms of supporting getting more women into the industry. So we ran a really successful networking event last year. We were able to get some great sponsorship, which really lowered the cost, which meant that it was easier for us to get, you know, our, our great CSOs and power planners and other people, students to come along to that event. Um, I think a particular highlight for me was having a few students there because um, they really got a lot out of the event. Yeah. So we've got something like that planned in the works as well. And um, it's likely we're going to merge, uh, we're go- likely going to do that as a combined event with another group that promotes women in the industry, mm-hmm. just to try and make sure we um, get as many people as we can there and it's a successful one. Yeah, that's fantastic. And where can people find out more about these in- at these events if they're interested in, in coming along? Yeah, well, the FAAA website. Um, has a lot of great detail on there. I know that um, the end of financial year event got launched this week yep. on the FAAA website. It's also all over LinkedIn if you want to have a look at LinkedIn. Um, but, you know, there is a great events team at the FAAA um, who helped to put a lot of these events together um, and they do a great job of making sure they're on the website. Um, and when we have more details on some of the other events later in the year, they'll be up there too. And some of those, so those Inspire events, they're kind of more southeast Queensland focused. It, it, are they, or is, is there like Melbourne and Sydney equivalents of, of yeah. those things going on? Yeah, there is. So across the country, there's a share of Inspire in every state. How nice! And um, we are organising the ones for for Queensland. So at the moment, in sort of, I guess over the past couple of years, they've been more focused on uh, southeast Queensland. But one of the things that the AFA and the FPA did really well is um, they came together and had a North Queensland Roadshow, which uh, was fantastic. Um, I wasn't able to make it, unfortunately, but I know a lot of the other people that are in the in the group went along and, and thought it was really successful. And I think there's might be plans to do that again. I'm not 100% sure. But as someone who spent quite a bit of my career in North Queensland, I'm pretty passionate about that. And um, I'd love to bring Inspire to the regions a little bit more think perhaps the appetite for Inspire is a little bit different. It's not something the regions are used to. I know when I was working up there, um, there wasn't a lot of industry events that went on. So people were probably used to, to networking with others as frequently. But I think you can get a lot out of doing that. You know, this is how we've connected. You know, I've met lots of great people in the industry. It's really what Ensemble is all about. Absolutely. Um, so, yeah, it'd be great to do that a bit more in the regions and bring different types of advice and the way that people do business um, to the region a bit more. Yeah, perfect. All right, well, thanks, Ali. We might just wrap it up there. Uh, thank you for joining me today. I've picked up a lot just from myself. I've got here writing down some notes. Oh, we've got to do this thing and do that thing. So I'm sure there's a whole lot of value for others that might be listening as well. Ali, you've been really generous with your time. Thank you for uh, spending time having a chat this morning. No problems. Thanks, James. Thank you. Thank you.